Welcome to today's K-State Garden Hour. This is your first time welcome. If you've tuned in with us before, thanks for coming back. We'd like to thank you all for joining us today and we are so happy that you're here. This series is hosted by K-State Research and Extension. My name is Kelsey Hattisall. I'm the horticulture agent for the River Valley District and I'll be your host for today. Before we get started with today's session, there's a couple of Zoom housekeeping notes if you are unfamiliar with Zoom. We're using a webinar version that may look a little different than the typical Zoom. You do not have any video or audio capabilities. You will notice that there is a spot on the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. This is where we would like you to put any of your questions that you have for today's speaker. Our moderator, Jason Graves, the horticulture agent in the Central Kansas District, will be keeping track of these questions through the Q&A tab, and we will do our best to get through all of the questions at the end of the presentation. In the event that we do not answer them all, we will be uploading additional resources for you on our horticulture and natural resources website. This will serve as a great reference after this presentation, and you should be able to find the answers to your questions on that website. You will be able to access today's presentation as it will be recorded. You can also find the previous topics and any upcoming presentations that we have on the website as well. The events in this series have also been posted on the K-State Natural Horticulture and Natural Resources Facebook page. You can stay tuned to what's going on within our department as well as stay up to date with any upcoming topics within this series. Be sure to like, share, and use the hashtag K-State Garden Hour to help us promote this program. We have recently added the upcoming September events to this series and we have some ex an exciting month ahead. Today's topic is fall lawn care. Our speaker is Matthew McKernan, the Sedgwick County Horticulture Extension Agent. Matt, when you're ready, share your screen and take it away. Well, thank you, Kelsey. I'm glad to be here with all of you this afternoon and well ready to talk more fall lawn care. We started this conversation last week with fall lawn care and uh, we're gonna continue it this week with some more things that you need to know and hopefully all the things that you need to know to have that greener, healthier lawn um, all summer long. So as we get our PowerPoint pulled up here, um, really wanna just kind of first of all recap some of the things that we talked about last week and hopefully give you an idea of some of the things that we hope to cover this week. Um, and especially when it comes to some of the maintenance practices that we'll do not only in the fall, but really all season long. And so just again, wanna welcome everybody for being here with us today and hopefully that we'll get through most of your questions. So if you have them, please do drop them in the Q&A box um, as we go through today's presentation. And there's so many reasons to love fall. I love fall for the cooler temperatures, the, the lower electric bills, the leaves, whatever the reason may be. And our lawns are also gonna love fall as well. And so there's a lot of things that we could be doing to our lawns this fall to really help them out, not only now, but the, that's gonna carry them through the rest of the year. And so last week we talked about part one of fall lawn care and that really focused on overseeding our lawns, planting new grass seed, laying down sod, all the things that we need to do to start a new lawn or to improve our existing lawn with planting. Um, so we talked about purchasing grass seed, watering that newly planted lawn, all the steps that are involved for that, what dates to follow. And just a sort of a really brief recap, um, some of the big things that we talked about last week is it's really important to use high quality grass seed. It's important to seed, when we put down our seed, to do it at about half rates in multiple directions to try to get as even of coverage as possible. We really wanna to try to maximize our soil to seed contact and that's gonna help regulate moisture around that seed and help it grow as easily as possible. It's also important to really keep our grass seed well watered once we've got it planted and really trying to get that planting done anywhere from now to October 15th um, in an ideal scenario. So if you missed any of that discussion last week, if you weren't able to join us, I would encourage you to check out our recording because that presentation was recorded and can be found on our K-State Garden Hour website. So if you scroll down past our upcoming events, you'll find the planting and overseeding your tall fescue lawn recording. And so all of the handouts and everything that we talked about last week can be there and you can easily review it. Um, because this week we want to talk about a few more things about fall lawn care and especially our watering, our core aeration, things like that. 
But it's important to realize before we start these conversations why lawns are important in the first place. Why do we even care about our grass seed? And we talked about this a little bit last week and oftentimes our lawns are going to reduce noise from roadside and other traffic by as much as 40% compared to our hard surfaces. Lawns are a huge way that we cool our natural environment. We often think of, think of trees as being a good cooler, but our lawns do that as well. Typically our lawns are going to be anywhere from 30% or so cooler than asphalt or other paved surfaces, and even 14% cooler than our bare ground. Lawns can increase our home values by as much as 15%. Lawns are also a really important way that we help protect our groundwater and our water supplies because grease, oils, pollutants often are really well trapped by thatch of our lawns and the roots of our grass as well. And that allows for microbial activity to break it down and actually destroy those pollutants before they get to our groundwater supplies or our um, surface water supplies. Another big thing about fall lawn care that's important when we talk about why grass is important is the average front lawn is going to have the same cooling effect as three central air conditioning units for an average house. So that's pretty cool to be able to have even just a small front lawn and be able to have our lawns three times cooler or, or the same effect as three central air conditioning units for the house. But one of the biggest reasons I think tall fescue lawns and lawns in general are important is we talk about the amount of carbon dioxide that they sequester through photosynthesis and the amount of oxygen they create. It only takes 2,500 square feet of lawn to create enough oxygen for a family of four. So really when we think about 2,500 square feet, that's only a 50 by 50 square foot section, which really isn't that big. I think most homeowners are going to have at least that amount of lawn, if not much more. So for a lot of people, a quarter acre is a good size lawn or kind of the average size lawn that a lot of people have. And so on that quarter acre of lawn, that's going to produce enough oxygen every year to produce for enough, excuse me, for a family of 17 people to be able to breathe from the oxygen produced off that lawn. So to me, that's a really cool fact and one of the great benefits of lawn that we don't often think about. If we look at it at a little larger scale and we talk about a football field, because I think that's a, a pretty standard size that people can picture, an average football field is actually going to have enough oxygen for 92 people that it produces every single year. So there's so many great reasons to have a lawn and to have a healthy lawn if we're going to be growing grass at all. And just like last week, one of the things that we talked about, it's also important to know your lawn and the type of grass that you're growing. Typically with fall, we're really focused on cool season lawns. And so that's going to be our tall fescue lawns, our Kentucky bluegrass lawns, maybe if we have ryegrass. Those are our lawns that we're really focusing on with this presentation and with fall lawn care in general, because these types of lawns really grow best in the spring and in the fall. And so there's often the, the maintenance that we do to them now is really gonna be what carries them through the rest of the year. Whereas if we talk about our warm season lawns, on the other hand, our Bermuda grass, our zoysia grass, our buffalo grass, all of these same principles are going to apply, but we're just using a different time of year in order to do these maintenance practices. So with Kentucky bluegrass and tall fescue, really the focus of today's presentation, September is the ideal month to do most all of these things. Whereas if we're talking about our warm season grasses, Bermuda, zoysia, buffalo, it's the same exact thing, but we're really just kind of holding off until the mid-May to June timeframe to do the fertilization, the core aeration, things like that. Um, so it's important that we know our grass so that we know when it's the best time to take care of it. Because if we just look at the advertising that you see in the newspaper or on TV, they're not necessarily selling you the things that you need during the times of year that you need it. Um, and so typically with our cool season lawns, this is going to be what's pictured here. Um, usually they're greener most of the winter. Um, they may not be luscious green, but there is still green at the base of the crown, as you can see there right above ground level. And our cool season lawns are going to be the ones that green up the earliest in the spring and are typically greener once even past our first freezes and frosts of the fall. And so our cool season grasses, really tall fescue is going to be the best cool season grass for most of Kansas. Um, Kentucky bluegrass is going to be probably the second best, but especially here, I'm in south central Kansas, we don't see as much Kentucky bluegrass as we do tall fescue. 
just because tall fescue typically has a little bit more heat and drought tolerance, uh, which makes it a little bit more adaptable across most of the state. But for those of you who are joining us from maybe northern Kansas, the, the Kansas City area, you may see a lot more Kentucky bluegrass. And it is a cool season lawn, so now is a great time to be taking action on it as well. Last week, we talked about some of the other cool season grasses like fine fescue, which include our creeping red fescue, our chewing fescue, our hard fescue, and our rye grasses. And last week, we really, we really focused on these being probably not the best grasses as our total lawn grass because they're gonna struggle in the heat and the drought of our summers. And so they may be mixed in our bags of grass seed. We may have them growing, but as far as the overall cool season grasses that are best for most of Kansas, tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass are gonna be the ones we want to go to. So for today's presentation, we really wanna focus on several things. We wanna talk about fertilization. We wanna talk about core aeration. We want to talk about our mowing and watering practices and those will carry us through all year long. And we also want to talk about weed control because all of these things we really can be focusing on this time of year to have that healthier lawn all year long. And we've talked about September being so important for multiple reasons and so all of these things, especially planting, fertilization, core aeration, now is going to be the ideal time to take care of a lot of that. And so when we're talking about our cool season lawns and some of the things we can do, we, we kind of have to break it down as what I'm gonna call this decision-making guide. And so last week we talked about planting and overseeding our lawn. And so if we're going to do either of those things, we wanna get that grass seed planted and we definitely wanna fertilize and core aerate this fall, but that's probably where we wanna stop. Whereas if we're not planting a new lawn, if we're not overseeding and we're just trying to work on the existing cool season lawn that we have, we want to focus more on fertilization, core aeration, but weed control becomes a lot more of an option because we can spray those broadleaf weeds, we can apply pre-emergence, and so that's really what we're going to focus on today. And the reason that we have more things that we can do if we're not planting our cool season lawns this fall is that oftentimes weed control and a lot of these products that we might talk about they actually are gonna be damaging on our newly planted grass seeds. So we wanna be careful that if we're in this category where we're planting or overseeding, we're a little bit more cautious when it comes to the weed control section of today's presentation. So let's jump right in and let's talk about fertilizing your lawn. Um, ideally with fertilization, this is what we want to happen. We wanna have our, our healthy lawns go from this to this, even greener, healthier, luscious, um, and, and just overall a better quality lawn. And I know this might be a little bit of an over-exaggeration of how tall we want our lawns to get or how much growth we want them to push, but that's really what our, our fertilization is gonna do. It's going to push our health of our grass and also as a result, push the growth of our grass as well. So we may not want it to be out of control like that first picture, but we do wanna use fertilization to improve our lawns overall health. So when we talk about fertilization, why is September an important month for fertilizer for tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass lawns? And typically one of the main reasons is it's going to really, by applying those fertilizers now, encourage a healthy root system on our grass. And the healthier a root system that we have on our grass, the better overall denseness we're gonna have and the better, all, better overall heat tolerance and drought tolerance we'll have through the rest of the year. We also wanna help build the winter food reserves for our lawns by fertilizing in the fall. And typically that's gonna help us reduce the amount of winter damage that occurs. We also wanna help our grasses, especially tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass, green up earlier in the spring. And actually fertilizing in the fall is what's going to help our grasses actually be able to green up earlier in the spring each year. And to give you an example of this, we, this is a picture of our Sedgwick County Extension Office, and we have an arboretum with over 300 different trees there. And so each fall, we typically fertilize our trees in the arboretum because that's the ideal time to fertilize them as well. Um, and so what you see here in March of 2017 is you see all of these dark green rings that are around the trees. And especially if you look out in some of our warm season grasses there, you can definitely see those green halos around the tree. And those are all places where in the late fall, we fertilized our trees and the grass is taking advantage of that extra fertilization to green up a little bit earlier. So trust me when I tell you these fall fertilizations really can make an impact the rest of the growing season on our lawns. 
So when we talk about fertilization, a great step for those of you who have a new lawn or have never done a soil test before would be to start with a soil test because that's going to tell you exactly what your nutrient levels are in your soil. And the way I look at a soil test is it helps us detect the invisible problems with our soil. Because when we just look at the, the soil itself, when we hold it in our hands, it's gonna be very difficult to tell, if not impossible, whether you have high levels of nitrogen or high levels of potassium or you need more phosphorus or whatever the case may be. And so really these soil tests are gonna help us determine exactly what the soil nutrient levels in our soil are to start with and where we need to go from there. I will tell you though that you probably do need to plan ahead to, if you want a soil test done this fall, it may be a little bit too late to get our September application in because it does take a couple of weeks for those soil test results to go out. And then oftentimes different agents around the state will look at those soil tests and give you some specific recommendations. But one of the reasons that soil testing and understanding our soil nutrients is important is there's a lot of different nutrients that our grasses actually need in order to grow. And a great way to look at this is what's called Liebig's Law of Minimums. And so his example is that if you have this wooden bucket here, or this wooden barrel that holds water, basically whatever the shortest stake or stave is on this wooden bucket is going to be the maximum amount of water that that bucket can hold. And so even though the backside of our bucket here is a lot taller, because the shorter stakes are on this side of the bucket, it's only going to hold as much water as that lowest stake is. And our plant growth is really the same idea when it comes to the nutrients that the plant needs to be able to pull out of the soil in order to grow. And so we can have excellent amounts of all of these different nutrients in our soil, but the plant growth is going to be restricted by whatever the lowest amount of nutrient is or whatever the most limiting nutrient supply is. And so even though 90% of our soil nutrients could be in great shape, oftentimes it's gonna be one or two nutrients like nitrogen that are gonna be low and then therefore limiting the overall growth of our grass. So when we talk about the different types of nutrients that we might be applying in our fall fertilizations, typically the three that we're gonna focus most on are gonna be what we call our macronutrients, things like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Typically these will be the big three that are most obviously labeled on all bags of fertilizer. And these are typically going to be the nutrients that our grasses need the greatest amounts of. Um, all of these nutrients that you see on the screen here, they're all required for plant growth to be able to happen. So our grasses need all of these, but typically the macronutrients here, these three are what our grasses need the greatest amount of. Um, the second biggest group of nutrients that our, our lawns and our plants are gonna need in Kansas is typically gonna be calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Um, again, oftentimes a lot of these are present naturally in our Kansas soils, but our grasses and plants in general are going to need fairly good amounts of these in order to grow healthy and have good plant growth. Then we have our micronutrients, and these are all just the different elemental nutrients that are present in our soil that our grasses need in order to grow, but basically we need smaller amounts of them. So oftentimes we have plenty of these micronutrients available. Um, but these are all going to be nutrients that are required for plant growth. Um, and so we have all of those nutrients and that seems a little bit overwhelming. And so I'll give you a few generalizations about a lot of these nutrients. Typically a lot of these, especially phosphorus and potassium, they're really going to be present in most of our Kansas soils in high enough amounts that they're really not a concern. Usually one of, especially with lawns, one of the most limiting nutrients is typically nitrogen. And that's for several different reasons. Typically nitrogen is gonna be used up by the plants relatively quickly. And nitrogen is also very water soluble. So as we water with irrigation systems, as it rains, typically that nitrogen is gonna get pushed down deeper into the soil where it may be harder for those plants to, to get the nitrogen they need. This is gonna vary though, depending on where you live, the type of soil, whether you have a clay soil or a sandy soil. Um, and oftentimes in new constructions where the topsoil has been hauled away or in properties like mine where we have a basement and all of that basement dirt was dug up and spread over the site rather than hauled away, we in those types of situations may have different levels of some of these phosphorus and potassium um, nutrients where we may need more. But again, the soil test will be what tells you 
for sure if you need more of those nutrients or not. So when it comes to fall fertilization of our, our tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass lawns, typically there's three months of the year where this fall fertilization is gonna be most critical in the growth and overall health of our plants. Typically the most important fertilization happens now in the month of September. And typically we want anywhere from a half a pound to a pound and a half of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Typically in the September months, we wanna use a combination of both slow and quick release nitrogen. And I'll, I'll define that a little bit better here in a second. November is going to be our second best month to fertilize our tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass lawns. Um, if we only fertilize once per year, do it in September, do it now. But if we want to do multiple applications of fertilizer, November is the second best month to put down those fall fertilizations. Again, in November, we want one pound of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet. And on this application, typically we want to use more of a quick release nitrogen source if possible, because those plants are going into winter. So the more that we can make that nitrogen readily available, the more it's going to help that root growth before winter hits. And November of all the fertilization times is typically gonna be what helps our grass green up the earliest in the spring. Um, so if you really want your lawn to be one of the first green lawns on the block, fertilize for that second time in November and that really helps that lawn green up earlier in the spring. A lot of people are gonna wanna fertilize in the spring and that's ideally not a great time to fertilize our tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass lawns. That's when you'll see all the ads and the commercials trying to promote you to buy fertilizers for your lawn. Um, but typically, oftentimes that's gonna create a weaker lawn rather than fall fertilizations. But if we do do a spring fertilizer application, typically we wanna do it in May. Typically we wanna have, again, one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. But it's important with this May application to keep it a slow release fertilizer. We wanna make sure that it slowly gives off that nitrogen all summer long. And typically if we're watering our lawns all summer long or we're trying to keep our lawns green all summer long, that's where we really need this third application of the slow release fertilizer in May. Oftentimes one of the points of confusion when people go out to buy fertilizer is trying to determine whether it's a slow release or quick release fertilizer. Basically the difference is how quickly that nitrogen is soluble in water. So our slow release fertilizers are typically gonna be water insoluble, which means they're gonna break down slowly over time. Um, typically keywords that you would look for on your bag of fertilizer include keywords like water insoluble nitrogen, slow release nitrogen, maybe products that are polymer coated or sulfur coated. Um, sometimes you'll see formaldehyde or urea formaldehyde products. And all of our manures like millorganite or poultry manure, fish meal, typically all of these types of nitrogen fertilizers are gonna be what we consider a slow release fertilizer. So something that we might wanna look for in the May application. Where in our September and November applications, we want something that's a little bit more quick release or more soluble in water. Um, and so typically with most of our fertilizers, most fertilizers are gonna be tend to be more quick release. And that's because they're easier and cheaper to manufacture. So typically that's what a lot of our fertilizers are. Um, so things like bone meal, um, keywords like water soluble nitrogen or aminone nitrogen or urea nitrogens, all of those are gonna be keywords for um, water soluble or quick release nitrogen sources. If the bag doesn't tell you that it's slow release nitrogen, basically you can assume that it's a quick release nitrogen product. Um, we do want to hesitate though, again, if we have our warm season lawns like Bermuda grass, buffalo grass, or zoysia, typically now is not the time to fertilize because they're going to start to go dormant for the winter. And so if we're fertilizing Bermuda or zoysia, typically we're going to be doing those two to four times a year, May, June, July, and early August. Typically though, with our warm season grasses, we want to be done fertilizing by August 15th or at least the end of August so that we're not pushing a lot of growth right before winter hits. Um, typically with buffalo grass, if you have a buffalo grass lawn, typically you're only fertilizing once per year in June. Um, so I just wanna clarify this before we continue on in this uh, conversation, because again, what we're talking about now is more Kentucky bluegrass and tall fescue lawns. So on our fertilizer recommendations, we typically talked about we need about half a pound to a pound and a half of actual nitrogen. 
And so it's important to realize that no nitrogen product or no fertilizer product that you're gonna buy is gonna be 100% nitrogen. Um, so we always wanna check the label on the bag to figure out what's in our bag of fertilizer, just like we wanted to check out what was in a bag of grass seed. Um, and so typically on most fertilizers, you're gonna see three large numbers. And typically those numbers represent the percentage of nitrogen, the percentage of phosphorus, and the percentage of potassium. It's technically potash is the chemical formulation, but basically just tells us the percentage of potassium. And so when we look at this bag of nitrogen fertilizer, for example, it's gonna be 1600, which means it's 16% nitrogen, 0% phosphorus, and 0% potassium in that fertilizer. So the important thing to consider is when we're trying to get one pound of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet, that's not one pound of fertilizer. Because this fertilizer product here is only 16% nitrogen, we actually are going to need seven pounds of fertilizer for every 1,000 square feet in order to get that one pound of actual nitrogen. And so I know this gets really confusing. Please do not panic about the math and the conversion of the actual nitrogen to the pounds of fertilizer that you need. Um, oftentimes, if you read and follow the label instructions, it's going to tell you exactly how much fertilizer to put down. But we also have a great publication, in this lawn fertilizing guide that does all of the math for you. So you don't have to worry about it. And on page two of this handout, and this will be something that's dropped in the chat, you can find online and it'll be posted with the recording. But basically what you'll do with this chart on page two of the publication is it lists the different percentages of nitrogen you might find on a bag, all the way up to 46% with your urea um, fertilizers here. So basically you would look at the, the percentage of nitrogen and you would look at the amount of square feet of lawn that you have to fertilize. So you would follow, let's say we have a 23% or a 2300 fertilizer, 23% nitrogen. We would go down this list until we find the size of lawn that we're trying to fertilize. So if we have 10,000 square feet and we buy this 23% nitrogen, basically what this chart tells us is we need to buy 43 pounds of fertilizer in order to get that one pound of nitrogen per every thousand square feet of grass. So like I said, don't let the math fool you. Don't let it intimidate you. There's great resources out there to help you figure out exactly how much fertilizer you need to be applying based on the type of fertilizer you're using. The other thing that is such an easy step when fertilizing our lawn, but so many people just don't take the time to do it, is we wanna make sure that after we're done fertilizing, we sweep off and or blow off any of the fertilizer that might've landed on the street, the sidewalk, the driveway, and actually blow that or sweep that back into the lawn. Because if we don't, all of these hard paved surfaces are gonna take it down to our curbs, down to our gutters, and eventually all of those lead right back to our community ponds, our rivers, and our streams. And so oftentimes these excess fertilizers um, they can create big algae blooms, especially in the summer months. And oftentimes people will blame agriculture for the causing that, but in our communities, in our urban environments, oftentimes our homeowners are just as responsible as anybody else. Because the grass clippings, the leaves, the fertilizers, all those things that get left on our hard surfaces get washed down the street and into our storm drains and into our water supplies. So it's really important that we take the few extra minutes to sweep off, use a leaf blower to blow off, all of our hard surfaces so that those nutrients actually end up in the lawn and not in our waters. The next big thing when we talk about fall lawn care is aerating your lawn. And there's a lot of different things that we can do to aerate our lawn, but core aeration and aeration in general is important for so many different things. Basically what we're trying to do with aeration is relieve compacted soils because the more compacted our soils are, the weaker and thinner our grass is going to be. Um, so especially if we have a lot of kids running around in the backyard or a lot of pet activity or a few areas where we cut back and forth all the time and have kind of worn a path into the ground, aeration is really going to help you grow plants better in those areas. Um, typically, it's also going to help reduce weeds, actually, because the more compacted our soils are, the more opportunistic our weeds are in those areas as well. Aeration is also gonna help us decompose thatch, help water and nutrients filter down deeper to help improve root growth. And it's also gonna get more roots or more oxygen down deeper to our roots as well. So aeration in general basically just encourages stronger, deeper root growth 
which again helps carry that plant through its growth all year long. So there's a lot of different ways to be able to aerate. Typically core aeration is going to be the most effective and that's going to be typically a machine that is going to pull little plugs of soil out of the ground and leave them on the surface of the, the ground, much like you saw in that previous picture. Um, there's other methods of aeration as well. Spiking basically uses a solid tine, like think of the tines on a pitchfork that basically just punch holes in the ground. That typically does less damage to our grass, but usually has a little bit shorter term effect on the overall health of the lawn. Verticutting and power raking are also going to help aerate our lawn to some extent, but typically just not as deep. Often these are going to help us control thatch in our lawns um, and can also, though, help get rid of some of that minimal compaction, especially surface compaction in our soil. If you don't want to aerate at all, good news is our earthworms, all of the worms that we have in our soil, those are nature's core aerators that actually do a lot for our soil health. So as much as we can increase and improve conditions for earthworms and other worms in the soil, that's also going to help aerate our grass over time. So we talked about core aeration being the best, and typically this is a, an image of what core aeration might look like. Typically with core aeration, they're going to pull out these plugs of soil out of the ground. Typically they're going to be about two to three inches long. Ideally, if we can get them about three inches deep, that's ideal. And as we core aerate, we want to make several passes over our lawn so that we get these holes about every three inches apart from one another. Again, they're going to help water and nutrients get down deeper into the soil, which is going to improve our root growth. So the closer we can get those to three inches apart from one another, the better off we'll be. If we're gonna core aerate, we wanna do it before we fertilize, before we put down grass seed, or before we put down our pre-emergent weed control products, because all of those can naturally work themselves down those holes and again, benefit our grass. Um, when we get those plugs of soil that are pulled up in the lawn, we wanna leave those plugs on the surface of the ground because we want them to break down over time and then refill all of those holes. If you don't like looking at the, at the plugs, you think it looks messy, you can go over with your lawnmower and grind them up or run it over with the lawnmower so it breaks them down into smaller pieces. That'll help naturally accelerate that breakdown process and refill those holes a little bit sooner. Um, but all of this core aeration is gonna help decompose thatch that might build up and basically old roots and things like that um, that could limit our water or nutrient absorption into the soil. The big thing also with core aeration is it takes three or more years of core aeration to really achieve the full effect. So if you give it a try just once or twice, you should see a little bit of improvement in the overall health of the lawn. But it's really once we start to core aerate for three or more years that we really start to see the health of our soil really improving the most. So I'll tell you the, the results are worth the wait when it comes to core aerating your soil. Give it a couple years of repeated core aeration in the fall and that'll really give you the best soil health and therefore best lawn growth as well. We also wanna talk about mowing because mowing is an important thing for our lawns all year long, but especially in the fall. Um, one of the biggest things with mowing is it's important to have the correct mowing height when we're out there mowing. And so typically on our tall fescue lawns, we wanna mow them to a height of about two to three inches tall. Um, if we have K31 tall fescue, more of the pasture type tall fescue, we could go a little bit higher, maybe two and a half to three and a half inches tall on our mowing height, but somewhere in that two to three inch range is going to be ideal for most all tall fescue lawns. The same mowing height is also going to be true for our Kentucky bluegrass lawns. Two to three inches is that ideal mowing height. Typically in the summer months, it's important to be on the higher end of that spectrum, but in the fall, we can start to mow a little bit closer to the two inch height if we want. With our warm season grasses, in case some of you have those, typically our buffalo grass needs mowed to about two and a half to four inches tall, and our Bermuda and Zoysia grass lawns can be mowed a little bit shorter to that one to two inch height. The important thing to keep in mind though, when you're picking the height to set your mower at, the lower that you're going to mow your grass, the more maintenance increases in your lawn. So as the mowing height decreases, the level of maintenance increases, and sometimes so does the depth of rooting as well. So when we're mowing, there's a few rules of thumb that we always want to follow. And typically one of those rules is the one-third rule. 
And basically that rule says that we never want to mow more than one third of the overall height of the grass off at one time. Because what that's going to do is it's going to stress our lawns and create a little bit of stress and potentially invite diseases or weeds to start impacting our lawn. Um, so what that rule means is if we have our mowing height is ideally two inches in our lawns, we want to wait till the lawn gets three inches tall before we mow and bring it down to two inches in our mowing height. We don't want to let the lawn get taller than three inches um, because then we're taking off more than one third of the total grass growth. If we're on the higher end of the spectrum here and we want our mowing height to be three inches tall, ideally we'd let that grass get up to four and a half inches tall, but no taller before we got out there and mowed. It's also important when mowing to try to not bag up those grass clippings and mulch them or recycle them back into the ground as you mow. Those grass clippings are an important source of nutrients for our grass. Basically, those roots are always trying to pull up the lawn or pull up those nutrients out of the soil and into the grass blades. So if we bag them up and haul them off, we're actually hauling off some of those nutrients as well. So regularly returning those grass clippings to your lawn may reduce up to 25% of the total nitrogen needed by your lawn in any given year. Recycling those grass clippings research shows can also oftentimes reduce or even eliminate the need for supplemental phosphorus or potassium to your grass as well, because that grass clippings are going to be an important source of those nutrients. Um, so mulching mowers are gonna be a great way to, to recycle these grass clippings because a mulching mower, basically the blade is curved, so it chops up those grass blades a few times before it drops them down. Uh, but even a side discharge mower where the grass blades shoot out the side of the mower, that's going to be fine as well to help uh, recycle those grass clippings down to the lawn. It's also important when mowing to make sure that our mower blades are sharp. We want to make sure that our mower blades cut as cleanly through the grass blades as possible, doing as little damage to the grass as possible. We shouldn't see any kind of shredding or tearing on the blades of the grass or the tips of the grass. And oftentimes if we see this, we know that we need to go out and sharpen our lawnmower blade because this type of damage to our grass is going to cause our grass stress and then make it a little bit less resistant to diseases and other problems. So when we start to see this tattering on our glass, grass blades, it's a good indicator that we need to get out and sharpen our lawn blades. The other thing is a dull mower blade really just brings down the overall visual impact of our lawn because the more tattered and shredded these grass blades are, the more browning you're going to see. And so that gives your lawn overall a much more brown or dead cast than if you had a clean, sharp mower blade. A few final tips for lawn mowing. Typically, we don't want to mow our grasses too short because that's going to increase the amount of stress on our grass and also oftentimes increase the amount of weeds that we see pop up in our lawns as well. It's better to mow our grasses a little bit on the wet side rather than letting them get too tall and breaking that one third rule because breaking that one third rule again shocks the grass and losing too much of its leaf surface and so it, it really can decrease the health of your lawn. Often with lawn mowing we want to make sure that we're mixing up the directions that we're running our lawn mower over our grass to try to spread out compaction so that we're not always running through the same wheel tracks every time we mow. It's also important when lawn mowing not to damage our trees and shrubs because these are not as easily replaced as our grass is. Um, we also want to make sure that our first mowing on our newly seeded lawns is done when we get to a grass height of about three inches tall. The last thing I want to focus on today is controlling weeds in our lawns. And, and everybody is going to define weed differently. Um, basically though, a weed is any plant out of place. And so for some people that may be a dandelion. Other people may want dandelions in their lawn for the pollinators to be able to support the bees and other pollinators in early spring. For some people, a petunia in a sidewalk crack can be a weed. For other people, a weed could be a red tulip in a field of yellow or a flower bed of yellow tulips. So a weed is any plant out of place. And so for everybody, you're going to define what plant is a weed differently than your neighbors and your friends. Um, so basically weeds are what you make them. And even this beautiful sunflower growing in the sidewalk crack could be considered a weed because it's a plant out of place. Typically our weeds are gonna be most common in areas where we have bare soil, compacted soils, or areas that stay really wet or really dry. Maybe those low spots in our lawns. 
And basically all of these places are undesirable to a lot of our other plants and especially hard for some of our grasses to grow. And so these are oftentimes the areas that we can see weeds pop up in the most. And ultimately the best solution for weed control is to have a healthy lawn because the healthier your lawn is, the more actively it's growing, the better it grows, the more plant competition you have. And so oftentimes a healthy lawn is gonna be the best way to reduce weeds and prevent weeds because it's going to outcompete those weeds or stop them from growing in the first place and make the environment less suitable for them. So why is September and fall an important time for fall weed control? And typically in fall, we all know that we start to get cooler temperatures. And oftentimes as the temperatures begin to cool, plants begin to move more of their nutrients out of the leaves and into the roots, especially on things like dandelions, as they prepare to overwinter and as those leaves prepare to die off in the cold. So when we apply our chemical products to the leaves, oftentimes they're gonna be more successfully transported from the leaves down to the roots, which allows us to kill the plants, the kill the weeds, roots and all, so that we get a more effective control out of our chemical control products. Um, versus when we talk about weed control in the spring, typically the energy is moving the opposite direction. The energy is coming from the roots out into the grass, uh, out into the leaves of the weeds. And so our weed control is often not as effective in the spring as it is in the fall. So hopefully this is nobody's idea of weed control where we have to go to such extreme lengths to get rid of those weeds. Um, but with weed control, there are several different techniques that we used. And like I said, having a healthy lawn is the best step to weed control. So doing all the mowing, the fertilization, the watering, all of those things at the correct time of year, that's going to be your best bet to control weeds. But if you're doing all of the right things and still have weeds, then we talk about our chemical weed control. Basically, that's kind of the last step or should be the last option in controlling our weeds. And with chemical weed control, there's, they can be broken down into different products or different classes of products. One of those groups is going to be what we call pre-emergent chemical control. And basically what a pre-emergent product does is that we put it down usually as a granular and we spread it over our grass and it creates this invisible barrier right at the soil surface. And what that invisible barrier does is it kills grass seeds right as they begin to grow and right as they begin to germinate. So this is gonna be a great strategy for controlling some of our annual weeds, things like crabgrass, henbit, chickweed. Um, the important thing to know with our pre-emergent products is they will not kill established weeds. So if we wait too late to apply these products, our pre-emergents no longer become an effective option. It's also extremely important to note that on our pre-emergent chemical control, pre-emergent products do not know the difference between a weed seed and a desirable seed. And so if we are planting a new grass or we're overseeding our lawn, we do not want to use these pre-emergent products because they may affect our germination of our newly planted grass seed. So if pre-emergent products aren't an option, the second group of chemicals is what we're going to call post-emergent products. And basically these post-emergent chemicals kill the weeds after they're already growing. And we can further define these post-emergent products into selective chemicals which basically you're only going to kill a specific type of plant material. And so think of killing broadleaf weeds in our lawn without damaging the lawn. So there's lots of products out there, for example, that would kill a dandelion or clover in the lawn without actually damaging the lawn. Um, and so those are gonna be our non-selective chemicals. Excuse me, I may have gotten that backwards. Nope, I'm on the right track here, sorry. Um, so our selective chemicals, those are gonna kill our broadleaf weeds without damaging the turf. Our non-selective weed control products though, those are gonna kill all products that they're applied to. So things like glyphosate, horticultural vinegars, some of those soil sterilants, those, it doesn't matter what you apply it to, typically they're going to kill it. And so oftentimes when we're talking about weed control in the fall, um, we really wanna focus more on these selective chemicals that don't damage our existing lawns, but do take care of some of those broadleaf weeds and those hard to control weeds. So if we have some of these already growing weeds in our lawn, we wanna look for some of these selective herbicide products that control the specific broadleaf weeds that we have. Typically, most of these products are gonna be safe on our established lawns, but also very effective at weed control, including weeds like clover and dandelion. Often in the fall applications with these products, we're gonna be most effective if we apply these products in October or early November. 
So we're not quite there yet, but usually if we apply our selective broadleaf weed control products in October to early November, typically what we're going to do is all of these plants like dandelions are going to produce one last round of new plants in the late September timeframe. So if we wait till October to early November, we not only get the established weeds that we have growing, but we're also going to get those new weeds that are just starting to grow as well. This is where we want to be, again, extremely careful if we're planting new grass seed or overseeding our lawns, any type of new, new seed that we're spreading out there. There is a waiting period between when it's safe for those chemicals to be applied and when it's safe to overseed. So typically we don't want to be applying these selective products before we um, put out that grass seed because it's going to restrict the growth of our grass seed once we put it out there. Usually there's a waiting period of at least four weeks. Sometimes it's longer up to a couple months. Um, so always check the label to make sure that you allow enough time between when these products are applied and when it's safe to seed or overseed your lawns. Typically, if you're going to overseed first, maybe you're putting your seed down now and want to apply some weed control later. Usually what most labels are going to specify is you need to wait till your lawn has been mowed at least two to three times before these products are going to be safe on a newly planted lawn. And again, it's important to always read the product label because not all chemicals will be safe on all types of grass. And especially when we talk about Bermuda grass and some of our warm season grasses, some of these products, the selective products, may cause a little bit of damage to those grasses as well. Oftentimes with our selective weed control products, what you're most commonly going to see is products that contain 2,4-D, dicamba, and MCPP. Um, they're sold under a thousand and one different products and a thousand and one different trade names, but these are typically the combinations of products that you most commonly see. And those are going to be ideal for a lot of our weeds and especially dandelions. If dandelions are a specific concern on our lawn, typically late October to early November is the ideal time to put down those products. Um, those combination products that contain 2,4-D, MCPP, and dicamba are very effective, especially in this fall time frame. If we wait a little bit too late into winter and we start to get cold early, um, and oftentimes when our temperatures fall below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, Carfentrazone is going to be a good active ingredient to look for for dandelion weed control and some of our broadleaf weed control because it's effective and safe to put down once our temperatures start to get below 50. So pay attention to that when you're purchasing your products as well. If we have other broadleaf weeds that are a little harder to control, things like wild violet, clover, cranesbill geranium, oxalis, poison ivy, um, these may be controlled by those 2,4-D combination products but oftentimes triclopyr is going to be a more effective product for it. Again, we want to apply that in late October to early November. And again, read the product label because triclopyr can be more damaging to Bermuda grass lawns or other types of lawns. Typically very safe on tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass, but again, just read that product label. Oftentimes, if we have some of the grassy weeds like crabgrass, grassy sandbur, bindweed, barnyard grass, quinclorac is going to be a very effective ingredient to control a lot of our grassy weeds, especially when they're small. The great thing about crabgrass, grassy sandbur is they're all gonna be killed out by the first frost. So if you have these weeds in your lawn, you really probably don't need to worry about applying a product right now because the first frost or freeze is gonna take care of that. Nut sedge is also a very popular weed that a lot of people are dealing with, especially since we've had some wet summers the last couple years. Technically, nut sedge is not a grass, and so when you find it in your lawn, typically it's going to be faster growing than the rest of your lawn. And if you feel the stems, typically they're all going to be triangular in shape. Typically with nut sedge, halosulfuron or sulfentrazone are going to be very effective products against nut sedge. It's going to take repeat applications, but these are going to be the most effective in control. The important thing with nut sedge control though is it really needs to be done in the late spring to early summer before the underground nutlets or tubers start to develop. Again, be persistent with nut sedge. It's going to take more than one application to get it, um, but these types of products will get you better control. We can also in the fall talk about preventing annual weeds, and so now is a great time to be thinking about preventing henbit and chickweed from popping up in general. Often these annual weeds are going to be weeds that germinate in the fall, but they're going to be most noticeable in the spring. So henbit, we really don't notice growing in the lawn now. It's going to be small all winter long, but once it, green, once it warms up in the spring, that growth takes off 
and is really going to get out of control. So with our annual grass or our annual weeds, we have two different options. We can use those selective herbicide products like we talked about earlier, and we apply those in late October to early November. And so that's going to get the weeds that are already growing. But if we want to be proactive and prevent those weeds in the first place, we can go back to looking at those pre-emergent herbicide products. Typically, those are going to be applied in early to mid-September, and these pre-emergent products prevent the weed seeds from growing. So it's not going to be effective once the weeds are already growing, but if we get these products out before the weed seeds germinate, um, it will be effective on them. It does hurt your newly planted grass seeds, so be sure to read your product label. Um, there's tons of pre-emergent products out there, but typically Barricade or Dimension are going to be one of them that we often refer to because they're going to provide you control for several months or what we call season-long control. So usually one application of Barricade or Dimension in the fall will get you weed control all the way through the spring. Um, there's lots of other products and they may be helpful on specific weeds, but often with these pay attention on the label because there will be multiple applications required in most cases. So if we have things like annual bluegrass, henbit, or chickweed that are a problem in our lawn, typically now mid-August to mid-September is going to be a great time to put down those pre-emergent applications. And typically, like I said, barricade and dimension are going to get us season-long control of all of these weeds. Oftentimes, little barley is a big problem for a winter weed for a lot of people. Um, again, it starts to germinate now and survives all winter long and is really noticeable in the early spring. Um, so with the little barley, we have to be careful because not as many products are effective against it. Um, so orilazine is going to be one active ingredient that's very effective against little barley for prevention. But dimension, dithiapyr is the active ingredient, is also going to be effective for little barley control. Little barley does start to grow a little bit sooner than henbit and chickweed does, so we may need to try to get that pre-emergent out there a little bit sooner in the summer just so that we get really good control. We'll use these same pre-emergent products in the spring to control things like crabgrass, foxtail, grassy sandbur, um, but we typically want to do it in the spring when our uh, redbud trees are in full bloom or those purple flowering trees you see across the state. So just to recap on fall lawn care and weed control specifically, a healthy lawn is going to be the best way to prevent new weeds from growing and it's also going to crowd out existing weeds. We also want to make sure that we're not mowing too low or too infrequently, having that proper mowing height, because if we're mowing too low, we're creating an opportunity for weeds to take over. We also want to make sure that we're not watering too frequently. Typically, our tall fescue lawns need about an inch to an inch and a half of water every week during the heat of the summer. Overwatering is oftentimes going to lead to more weeds. Uh, we also make sure that we don't over fertilize and we also don't fertilize at the wrong time because those spring applications of fertilizer especially are really going to help our weeds. So for tall fescue, really focus those fertilizer applications in September and November and that will help you cut down on weed control. Um, we also want to make sure that we're core aerating and relieving compacted soil so that we create a better growing environment for our lawn which then can outcompete those weeds. So. I will end it with that and make sure we get some time here for questions. So what do we have here today? All right, well, thanks, Matt. That was a great uh, refresher, and great presentation. Um, so we do have some questions that have come in. Um, we'll start with a question regarding soil testing, which is a good place to start. So the question is, how often do you need to do a soil test? Sure, oftentimes if you do a soil test, it's gonna be good for probably two to three years. Um, unless you're doing major changes or major groundwork at your property. Um, but usually it's a soil test will give you pretty accurate results for a two to three year period. Awesome. Okay, the next uh, question uh, that relates, we have a couple questions relating to aeration and that practice on our yard. So first one, maybe just a reminder of uh, what you said, how often should we be aerating a lawn? Sure. So typically, if we core aerate our lawns once a year in the fall, that's going to be probably good enough. If we want to do it a second time in the early spring, we probably could. Um, but aeration does damage our grass because it's punching holes through the grass into the roots. Um, so we don't want to over aerate. So I'd say once a year is ideal, um, but maybe up to twice a year if you want it. Yeah, okay. Heavy clay soil. Awesome. Great, so follow up with that, are moles, earthworms, and grubs 
good sources of aeration. Do they do, do earthworms do any aeration in our yards? Yeah. Absolutely. Earthworms are going to be nature's great core aerator. And so we really want to encourage worms whenever possible. Moles are also going to do good aeration. Um, the only problem with them is that often causes our roots to dry out because of the tunnels that they push up and the airflow that flows under the roots. Um, so they are good core aerators, but it, it can be a little damaging to the grass as well. Yes, definitely. Okay, um, uh, follow up one more regarding some aeration here. Um, regarding applying lime, or we might even say sulfur, I guess, depending on the case, is which one would you do first? Would you aerate first and then apply that, or would you apply the sulfur and then aerate? I would always core aerate and then apply your soil amendments, whether that's sulfur, lime, or fertilizer. Because ideally what we want to happen is as we're spreading those products, we want to try to allow them to fall down into the holes so that they get deeper down to the root system. Okay, excellent. Um, does the size, uh, a question here on fertilizer, does the size of the fertilizer granule have any effect on effectiveness? I would say is the size of the granule should not have any effect on it. Um, the, it depends, I'd say the bigger thing that's gonna make a difference is what the product is. If it's sulfur coated, polymer coated, one of those slow release products, often those are a little bit more heat and temperature dependent on how quickly they release because they rely on microbes to break it down. Whereas if you have a quick release fertilizer, regardless of the pellet size, water is gonna break that down and apply it to the lawn relatively quickly. Okay, excellent. Uh, this is a, a question, I'm not sure we can, we'll ask it and see what you think on it. If we okay. leave clover, so if we leave clover in the yard, any idea how much nitrogen it would add? I don't have an exact number that I can give you on how much nitrogen clover fixes in the ground. Clover is a good, uh, it is one of those crops out there that um, takes nitrogen out of the atmosphere and puts it down into the soil. So it is beneficial, but I can't tell you how much that's going to replace. Okay, good. Um, we've had a couple questions regarding, is this still a good time to deal with a Bermuda grass or a zoysia grass invasion in the yard? And what would we do to do that? So everybody's definition of a weed is different. So if Bermuda grass or zoysia grass is considered a weed, you can still be effective this time of year in controlling it. Um, but ideally, you might, might have started back in late July, um, because typically with Bermuda grass, what we're going to do is we want that grass to be as actively growing as possible before we apply our, um, our weed control products to it or our Bermuda control products to it. Usually that's glyphosate and that's a non-selective product that's going to kill any green plant material that you put down on it. Um, triclopyr can suppress Bermuda grass, so multiple applications of that may help. Um, but typically, as Bermuda and zoysia start to get into the fall, they start to work more on preparing for winter and going dormant. And so sometimes those products aren't quite as actively absorbed. And then we also want to usually give our grass a few weeks or a couple months to start to come back after we make those applications so that we can get a second treatment or a third treatment, because oftentimes just one treatment on Bermuda grass isn't going to kill it. Okay. Excellent. Um, I'm going to follow that up with one question we got earlier on Roundup uh, or glyphosate. Uh, uh -huh. is, uh, what's the re they're wondering what the reseeding interval would be after using Roundup. So check the product label, but typically with glyphosate, if that's the only active ingredient in the product, usually the reseeding interval is one to three days, which makes it a great product because you don't have to wait weeks or months between when you spray it and when you can overseed. A lot of other products are going to take a lot longer, but I think glyphosate is probably one of our quickest products. Okay, excellent. Um, any idea how long a high quality grass seed will be viable? How long will it last? Yeah, and we talked about that a little bit last week, but it depends on how it's stored, the temperature, the humidity, things like that. And basically those grass seeds, the longer you keep them, generally the, the less viable they become. So um, I'd encourage you to check out last week's presentation, but uh, Ideally, if you can use it within one to two years, you're better off. Excellent. Um, do you, so this is a question about fertilizing uh, with overseeding. Do you fertilize before you overseed or after or at you the can, same time? You can do it at the same time as far as I'm concerned. Um, okay. Make sure you're not putting down too much fertilizer that you'd be burning your grass, but typically I think it's safe to do them both at the same time. Okay, excellent. 
Um, do, you, do you recommend um, horticultural corn meal as a pre-emergent? So corn gluten meal is what they're referring to, and it, it does have some pre-emergent products. Typically, it is not going to be as effective as like your synthetic pre-emergent products are going to be. Um, it does have some effect, and especially for people, I think research shows the more you use it, the more years in a row, typically the better it does. Um, so if that's a product you want to use, you may consider pairing it with a synthetic pre-emergent just to get you better control the first year. Um, but there is some research out there on corn gluten meal if, if you wanted to look into that. Okay, excellent. Um, it, there's a question, we're getting close to time here. Should, should I use a start, starter fertilizer when I put out my new seed next week on an established yard? Absolutely, and we talked about that last week as well, so I'd encourage you to check out that recording. It, it'll help your newly grass seed, but it's probably not required. Often we have plenty of phosphorus and potassium in our soil, so um, it's not critical that you do it, but it will probably help benefit the grass. Okay, excellent. Well, we are at one o'clock. Um, there's a, a couple other questions here, so I'd encourage folks to check out the website afterwards, and hopefully we can, we can help you get, we'll have answers to those. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Kelsey, and we're going to finish up, I believe. Thanks, Jason and Matt. Once again, thank you all for joining the K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We are so glad you could be here today to learn about fall lawn care with us. Join us next week for Getting the Buzz on Honeybees. Be sure to visit our website to see all the upcoming topics. Once again, this session will be recorded, was recorded and will be posted by tomorrow afternoon. After the webinar ends today, you should receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please fill this out. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at ksuemg at ksu.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and have a great rest of your week.